Buckingham Palace, the face of the British royal family to billions of people around the world, epicentre of all the great events of the state and nation, and the most famous royal building on the globe. I've always wondered what it was like inside, so yesterday I paid for a tour of the place with my wife. The experience has left me frustrated, a bit angry, and frankly bemused. As many of you know, I don't normally post reviews on this channel of various places that I visit, but I just have to say something on this occasion. The first thing you notice about Buckingham Palace as you approach the visitor's entrance next to the Queen's Gallery is the staff's obsession with lavatories. We arrived slightly early and were told to wait for a quarter of an hour before joining the next tour and a member of staff spent some time, without being asked, pointing out that we'd better go to the toilet before entering the palace, as there are no public conveniences until the end of the tour. The nearest public convenience was an astounding five blocks down the street, the first clue perhaps to how welcoming the palace is to visitors. It costs £30 each to visit the building, but you can't spend a penny once inside. The second introduction to the type of establishment you are entering were our interactions with members of staff. The staff wear the uniform of the royal household and are the visible human face of the place, but if having a face like a smacked ass and the customer service skills of the Gestapo are prerequisites for employment, the palace has certainly met its recruitment goals. Even before going through security, my wife and I were barked at several times for various invisible infractions of the rules before being herded with other miscreants, also known as visitors, onto hard wooden benches in a sort of holding pen. After a short while, the most astounding scene was played out when one female guard, in a loud voice, drummed the following three points repetitively into our heads. 1. No photography is allowed in the palace. What? Hang on a minute. Buckingham Palace is funded by the state through taxpayers. Taxpayers like me and my wife, but photography is verboten. No reason was given for this ban, though my excitement was briefly piqued as to what they have inside the place that is so secret that mere mortals must not catch its image. However, my enthusiasm was soon quashed by point number two. If you have a backpack, you may not wear it on your shoulders. You must carry it at all times in your hand. Fortunately, my wife and I were not sporting backpacks, but I felt very sorry for those that were, particularly those with children. Buckingham Palace has 775 rooms. Yes, you didn't mishear me, that's right, 775. And you would have thought that one could have been found for conversion into a locker room, as found at the National Gallery, the British Museum, etc, etc. Though, to be fair, the backpack rule did give the staff something to do, apart from scowling at visitors. They could instead constantly hassle anyone foolish enough to shoulder their backpack during the tour, and many a miscreant was admonished in my presence. And rule number three. You've guessed it, folks. There are no lavatories for public use until the end of the tour. Quite a number of the visitors were elderly or with young families. Shuffling through airport-style security, which was reasonably polite, and picking up a free audio guide, we began the tour. Obviously, I can't show you any photographs or videos of my palace tour as it was, of course, forbidden. However, it was all very nice seeing rooms you've seen many times on television, and the rooms open to the public are, of course, lavishly decorated, the amount of gold-painted furniture, pianos and urns, similar to what I imagine Liberace's house looked like. The walls are hung with the usual assortment of well-fed Hanoverians, and the long gallery with a large collection of mostly Dutch old masters. I would have enjoyed the experience a little more, but for the crowds. The palace appears to operate on the principle of bums on seats, or in this case, feet on pile carpet, and crams the maximum number of visitors into each room. Moving around inside the house was a bit like the pushing and shoving normally seen on the pitch at Twickenham, and was just as sweaty and unpleasant, broken only by one of our number being singled out for a yellow card for backpack infringement. In the ballroom, where investitures are normally held, a small exhibition of coronation paraphernalia was on display, but due to the room resembling the boat deck on the Titanic when the crowd found out the last lifeboat had actually departed, we skittered through the mob, catching a glimpse of diamonds or the top of King Charles III's head here and there, and into the back of the palace and some fresh air. 
It was a hot day, and we headed for the tea tent for some refreshments. However, this was another exercise in futility. The café is too small for the number of people they let in. For foreign visitors, they were inducted into the delights of interminable queuing, a very British tradition, at the end of which was another surly member of the palace staff and a demand for a ridiculous number of coins of the realm in return for some rather unsatisfactory beverages and or food. If you fancy a sit-down after your strenuous exercise inside the palace, you will be disappointed, as they have not provided enough seating. The place was incredibly overcrowded, hot and fairly dirty, with food and other detritus strewn under tables and chairs, and hardly any staff clearing anything up. We had paid extra for a tour of the garden, but skipped it, as the garden appeared to be a large lawn, some big trees, and not much else. In fact, it resembled an English provincial park, minus any interesting features, including flowers. Last stop was the gift shop, a very large building in the grounds, perhaps showing where the management's priorities really lie. It was rammed to the gunnels with the usual royal tourist tat. Deciding to vacate the premises, my wife and I followed the one-sixth of a mile path to the side gate, which actually takes you through a very large part of the garden without having to pay extra for a tour, past a few overheated and remarkably slovenly members of staff, to the exit, where we met the only enthusiastic, positive, and switched-on member of staff for an entire trip, which was a bit ironic. His job was to stamp our tickets to convert them into one-year passes, so you can revisit the palace for free. The only problem with this apparent largesse is that the palace is only open to the public for two months of the year, not twelve months. I think the exit really needs a large sign reading, Thank you for the cash peasants, now naff off. Now when I think about Buckingham Palace I think of a sausage machine. In the entrance go various shades of British royalists and keen foreign tourists, and out the exit pour large numbers of newly converted British Republicans and bemused Americans thanking their lucky stars for 1776. I didn't quite think that was the royal family's intention, but judging by the number of hostile reviews on various online sites, I suggest whoever runs the palace might be working for the other side. It wouldn't be the first time, after all. The keeper of the Queen's pictures for over 30 years, Sir Anthony Blunt, turned out to be a KGB agent. To provide some balance, my wife and I next visited the Royal Mews next door, where they keep the horses and carriages, and I have to say it was an excellent experience. And I'll be making a video about that in the future. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.